a nearly book-length manuscript on, Al on Alabama's economy. The, the study is called Alabama at the Crossroads, an Economic Guide to a Physically Sustainable Future. It's available on our website. I obviously won't be able to cover all of it today. We cover many, many areas, um, we look, uh, including tax reform, constitutional reform, educational reform, pension reform. Um, so I won't be able to address them all, but uh, what, I will, uh, what I do want to tell you today is where Alabama stands, especially in relation to the nearby states that we're competing with for residents and businesses. So where does Alabama stand today? Alabama ranks 45th in the Business Insider State Economy rankings and 45th in Forbes Best States for Doing Business. Our income per person, our income per person was ranked 44th in the nation at $37,512. That is 2,800 below the regional average. So that means for a family of four in Alabama, we make $11,000 less than the, than the average for the, our neighboring states. This difference will only grow. So this is a big concern when, uh, when you look at GDP growth rates. 2014 GDP growth in Alabama was only 0.7%. Texas had 5.2, Florida 2.7, Georgia had 2.3, and Tennessee had 1.7. Most people, they hear those growth rates and they say, well, that sounds important. <clears throat> These are more important than, than you can possibly imagine. When it, comes to, when it comes to economic prosperity, growth rates are essentially all that matters. If these growth rates persist, it will take Alabama nearly 103 years to double its economy. 103 years. Texas, it will only take 13.8 years. Florida, 26.6. Georgia, 31.3. And Tennessee, 42.4. Without fundamental reforms, Alabama is going to continue to fall further behind. Now, one of the primary reasons for Alabama's lackluster growth and showings in, in these rankings is Alabama's low level of economic freedom. While Alabama does rank in the middle of the pack on the economic freedom of the of North America index, we're 27, our neighbors rank much higher. Florida is 21st, Georgia is 10th, Tennessee is 9th, Louisiana is 5th, and Texas is first. Thank God for Mississippi, which comes in at 48th. <laughs> it's the only one we're beating. Uh, I know many of you are Trojan fans, but uh, for monitoring the SEC, you know you can't just beat Mississippi, and, and that's not sufficient. You gotta do better than that. Uh, so the, these differences are extremely, extremely important. Just a one unit increase in economic freedom on this scale can result in up to 4% job growth per year. 4% job growth in Alabama would be 80,000 new jobs every year. 80,000 new jobs for just increasing economic freedom. The most economically free states also have uh, higher personal incomes. 14% higher, in fact, than the least free states. And they have substantially higher economic growth. So that begs the question, why is Alabama ranking so low in terms of economic freedom, especially in relation to our nearby states? One word, overspending. Adjusting for population and inflation, Alabama has overspent by 21% since 1999. 21%. Alabama spends $5,000 per citizen, which is substantially higher than our neighbors. Alabama, so te Texas spends $3,500. Georgia spends $4,200. Florida spends $3,200. One reason for this is our high public employment. Alabama has 20.3 government workers for every 100 private sector workers. 20% of our workers work for the, the state or local government. Florida has only 14.3, Georgia 17.2, Tennessee 16, and Texas 16.9. Not only do we have high public employment, we also pay our public sector workers much higher than their private sector counterparts. We pay our, private se our public sector workers 11 to 20% more than their private sector counterparts in Alabama. Now that compensation also includes mandatory enrollment in our, our state pension system, the retirement systems of Alabama. This is an area of reform that cannot be ignored. An overwhelming majority of economists believe that without pension reform, states will be forced to resort to austerity budgets, uh, federal bailouts, and or even default. For instance, the RSA, according to their own numbers, is underfunded by $15.4 billion. However, this estimate is calculated using what Josh Rao, who's a professor of finance at Stanford University, at Stanford University, he labels it an economically invalid actuarial method. 
that understates pension liabilities, somewhat purposely. An overwhelming majority of economists agree with it, uh, Josh, concurring with the statement that state pension funds use misleading actuarial methods to understate their liabilities. My study finds that using more appropriate actuarial techniques brings the RSA's unfunded liabilities to between 35 and $61 billion. That means we're only 30 to 40% funded on these, on these liabilities that we owe. That would take four to seven years of tax revenue if we dedicated every cent of our tax revenue just to pay that off. That's a substantial amount of money we owe. The good news is, and there, there is some good news, is that public employees like myself who have an average job tenure of just 7.4 to 7.9 years aren't looking for a traditional pension uh, plan like the RSA. Because the RSA has a 10-year vesting period. So for most employees, it actually doesn't, uh, doesn't serve them well. Uh, we better recruit public employees and retain high quality public employees by transitioning to a more portable retirement option, similar to like a 401k, to better compete with the private sector, the majority of which uh, private sector employees or players offer individual retirement accounts with vesting periods under three years. Inevitably, every time I, I, I give this talk and talk to policymakers, Every discussion of Alabama policy always turns to taxes, as if we faced a, a revenue problem and not an expenditure problem. The Public Affairs Research Council of Alabama recently reported that Alabama has the lowest taxes per capita in the nation. They, along with many state politicians, have used this as argument for raising taxes. I actually think it's an argument for lowering taxes. Let me explain. Yes, our tax revenues are low, but it's primarily because our tax rates discourage economic activity and personal and business migration to the state. Alabama's 5% income tax is the 31st highest in the nation. That's higher than Florida, Tennessee, and Texas's income tax. Alabama's 6.5% corporate tax is the 26th highest in the nation. That's higher than Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, South Carolina, Texas, and now Tennessee, which recently voted to eliminate theirs. Alabama's state and local tax is the fourth highest in the nation. Liquor, fourth highest, beer, third highest, wine, fifth highest. In fact, the only things that we have relatively low taxes on are uh, property, gasoline, and cigarettes. Alabama has been discovering the hard way that you cannot tax your way to prosperity. Our neighboring states, who have more, who we're competing with for residents and businesses, have more competitive tax structures. And they generate more tax revenue by attracting people to their state, by encouraging business growth by encouraging uh, businesses to hire more employees, by having more reasonable and more competitive tax structures. In our study, we actually eliminate, we actually suggest eliminating the income tax in Alabama altogether to be competitive with Florida and Tennessee. When it comes to reforming Alabama, uh, I, I can't stress it enough, there are no magic bullet solutions. We need to roll up our sleeves, we need to cut spending, we need to ensure that government spending doesn't spiral out of control again. Uh, our study offers several in-depth ways to do this. Reforming K-12 education, privatization, pension reform, criminal justice reform, Medicaid reform, increasing political transparency and accountability to reduce corruption. Uh, we also make, rec uh, budget, make, make budget recommendations, including strict tax expenditure limits that tie annual expenditures to the state's population growth and consolidated dating the budget and reducing earmarked revenues. However, and this is the most important thing I'll say today, no constitutional provision, no reforms will actually constrain a democratic majority that supports tax and spend policies and politicians. After our nation's founding, Thomas Jefferson stressed the need for an educated public to preserve our newly won liberty, writing that if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. We see this as true at the national level and the state level. Even when we elect true fiscal conservatives to the White House, such as Ronald Reagan, we still see government debt grow, federal employees increase, the number of pages in the tax code and the federal registrar continue to increase. Ultimately, the only real constraint a government faces is ideological constraint. Citizens have to understand, appreciate, and constantly defend the principles of limited government and free enterprise. Unfortunately, the left has a stranglehold on the most formative years of young adults' uh, lives when they're seeking their political identity, college. 
A recent report by the Higher Education Research Institute found that only 12% of college faculty, 12% identify as being far right or conservative, while 60% identify as being far left or liberal. And this shows, looking at our current electoral, electoral <coughs> landscape, it is evident to me that the right has lost its intellectual foundation. That should definitely be a concern for people on both the right and the left. Wrestling with competing viewpoints is a necessary component of the educational process. It's the only way for students to learn to formulate independent, informed views. Winning an election today is more about tying together special interest groups than it is about a serious discussion of principles. And if we don't get in that serious debate about principles, we're going to lose because that's our strength, is we have principles and we have principles that are economically sound and valid. And when we deviate from that, we set ourselves up for losing. To truly restrain the growth of government, we need to expose students to the ideas our nation was founded upon, the ideas of limited government and economic freedom. These ideas have brought unprecedented wealth and prosperity wherever they've been impl implemented around the globe. With the Johnson Center, Troy University is, is one of the few universities in the nation where this happens, unfortunately. Yes, the students in the Johnson Center still read Karl Marx, they read Thomas Hobbes, they, they read John Maynard Keynes, they learn philosophical critiques of capitalism. But they also, and this is the important part, they also read Adam Smith. They also read Milton Friedman. They learn the basic principles of economics, and they explore the miraculous benefits of a free enterprise system. They learn, to quote John Allison, the former CEO of bb and Bank, that you do not have to feed hungry children in Africa to make the world a better place to live. Businesses make the world a better place to live. In fact, one of the primary differences between the quality of life in the U.S. and Africa is that the U.S. has better businesses. Businesses provide products and services that improve the quality of life. Business is the act of production. Without production, there cannot be any consumption. Before anyone can redistribute anything, someone has to produce it. In my humble opinion, I think centers like the Johnson Center are by far the most important thing we can do to preserve economic freedom and restore the principles of, of limited government and democracy here in America. Thank you very much. Okay.